Hello and welcome back to OT the Podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time, and how to spend it very well indeed. My name is Felix Schultz. Evil henchman Schultz, uh, as you're hey. now popularly hey. known. Hey. <laughs> no, and I'm Andy Green. That. Hi, Andy Green. Are you, well, you're not, are you a henchman? What would you be? You'd be no, like I a, didn't even make it to henchman status. Sidekick. I'm like a foot soldier. Uh, if you're if you're on the the good guy side, you're a sidekick. So you'd be a sidekick. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, like Robin. Uh, yeah. How would we describe our guest today in in the the pantheon of villains and heroes? Mm. It's like the Terminator. Whoa. Okay. I was yeah. thinking um, the 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 park owner in um, Jurassic Park, <laughs> Doctor Hammond, mad scientist, James Dowling, aka Mister Rolex. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, if anyone could bring dinosaurs back uh, from the dead, I think it'd be James Dowling. He'd have the abilities and the skills. I haven't seen evidence to the contrary. <laughs> have they been in the same room? Haven't <laughs> you? <laughs> Show me otherwise. Uh, yeah, we've got James Dowling coming back on. We're going to talk about weird watches. Nice. Quartz. Yep. And a bit of a, a shift in the old collecting mindset, um, which is, you know, maybe a little bit relevant given the last 12 to 18 months. But before we do that, Felix, what have you been up to? Yeah, look, I, before I dive into dive into my next topic of conversation, I always find it affirming chatting to James Dowling. He's very, um, I like where he comes from in terms of uh, that collecting approach. What have I been doing, Andy? I've been vaguely distracted right now because I'm pulling up ot.podcast on Instagram mm. to see how our competition's going. I've been reading Depth Charge by Jason Heaton. We published the episode uh, last week, mm-hmm. and I'm about 32% of the way through, according to Kindle, because I bought it on Kindle and hard copy because I'm such a Heaton stan. Uh, and I've got to say, no spoilers, but turns out that Henchman Schultz isn't a great guy. <laughs> so it's based on a true story then? Oof, no. Uh, you, you, you haven't... Uh, read it's fueling that narrative every time right. I get a chance. Uh, so, but we did a competition and I think it's kind of most like, we'll probably be closed. Maybe if you're, you're listening to this as we hit launch, mm. you can get your, get your entry in to, to win in the comp. Uh, where Pacific we give away time, a book. Felix. Yeah, um, Pacific time. Where we uh, we get we're giving away a book, a signed copy, uh, for listeners to suggest the best evil henchman Schultz watch. And do you know what shook me to the core? What's that? Two people have guessed watches I have either either currently own or have owned in the past. Which fact, not fiction. What can I, we say? And I don't think they're people that know me. <laughs> I don't think they are either. Um, so I just thought I'd do a quick little shout out to some people and some of the, the great selects they've gone through because, you know, uh, it's cool. Uh, Andy Green Live said that Evil Schultz probably wears some sort of a Frank Mueller. Party <laughs> ha ha ha. Andy Green, you dick. Um, <laughs> Alan Mensa said that Evil Schultz wears a Vostok Amphibia. Mm-hmm. Real Schultz wears one of those too. So, you know, not far off. Uh, Quantum Ocean Lawyer, who I think is possibly on the evil henchman's legal team. Uh, <laughs> he says that uh, an Aquastar Deep Star is the one to go with because of uh, Jason's love of the brand, which I think is a solid, solid bet. I think this is possibly one of my contenders for a favourite uh, winner sure. at the moment. Um, but Jason, of course, I think has the, the deciding vote. Uh, Tarina Taff era Zenith Diver, which I think is on brand. Uh, a couple of doxes, a Belova Accutron Deep Sea 666. Again, another watch I owned, Uncanny, Mr. Shepherdson. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and Bender V, uh, he's actually a former East German operative and he wears a Rakita Amphibian, which, I mean, yeah, a lot of... You're loving it. You're loving your, your time in the spotlight, aren't you? I, I mean, it's great. I mean, are you a henchman, Andy? Have you ever... uh, I'm not. Have and you hedged? I had another great... Um... A great watch that you could uh, you could wear in theory, the Gerard Perigo. Uh, what is it? The Chrono Hawk that you're obsessed Seahawk, with. Seahawk, the Seahawk, the Seahawk, not Seahawk one, Seahawk two, the Seahawk two. I'm just going to pull that up on Google just to refresh my uh, my memory. And I think, yeah, that's you. Strong Hench, Strong Hench. Do you think the um, yeah, it'd be the Black Dial? The uh, yeah, four nine nine zero. I kind of like. There's sort of a strong theme of like when I'm not henchmaning, I'm like hanging out at tacky club med bars with Russian oligarchs. 
You can't. You know what I mean? Like that sort of. uh, Maybe I I got some walk-on roles in John Wick Three as like a, uh, you know, like a Russian thug that gets gets taken out pretty quick. That sort of vibe. Swiftly. Uh, Do Do you think that Evil Henchman Schultz is going to get a um a spin-off series? I mean, without spoiling the book, because I'm I'm not finished yet. I'm not sure what what Hedgeman, or maybe maybe Hedgeman Schultz has a little little um, maybe he becomes the end, the hero at the end of the day. I don't know. I mean, may, maybe uh, maybe it could be like one of those sort of gritty comic narratives where we see how he became evil, <laughs> like a flashback series. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be studied. You think know, be in ten years' time? Do you think like year twelve students are going to be studying? Tell you what. Let's get Jason Heaton, Tim Mosso, and me together. We'll work it up. <laughs> Comic book series spin off. Yeah. We'll make it happen. Goodness me. All right. Well, I think what we should do before we talk to Mr. Rolex, uh, James Dowling, is talk about our hands on experience with the new Rolexes because we did an episode all, uh, all about the new Rolexes and new tutors. And that was before we saw them. And then about oh, probably two weeks ago, we had the opportunity to go in, see the guys from Rolex. Here in Melbourne, and yeah, see, see some watches. Ninety-eight percent of the new watches. There was a couple of sort of non-catalog models that we didn't get to see, but for the most part, I think we saw everything. Uh, the core, everything that yeah, like we didn't see every dial of the new palm motif, for example. No, unfortunately, we didn't, but we did see the green palm motif. But and I mean, the working, silver, the silver and gold one, I think they had there too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Working through the big ones, though, I think you know the new Explorer uh, thirty-six mil was uh, awesome, hands-on. Very um, one thing I, I that stood out to me on that watch was sort of the clasp and the taper that they've sort of worked into that watch and just how sort of fine it was. Um, but I'm a can, I'm a big fan. What did you think I of the two tone? Can I come at you with a really controversial hot take? Yep, I was really disappointed with the the new explorers. Even the two tone. You know why? Why? Didn't fit on my bloody meat hooks, did they? Yeah, I mean, I, this is an interesting thing because I so I have the um, 36 op. And like, I don't have big wrists, but I take, I think one link out, which concerns me because you'd need to add in three or four. And I don't know how, whereas other sport, like professional models, it could be three links out. So there is a, like they're saving money on the, on the, on the links used and the bracelets. And they're, first of all, that means they're not designed to be longer. So if you do add links in, it's going to kind of mess with things. But yeah, you're in a position where you, you probably so, can't wear one. Yeah. So my take on that is typically on my wrist, uh, Every, I've got a larger wrist than average, I think. Um, every sort of prototype Rolex that you see at, you know, these sort of showings mm. will fit me perfectly. Like, yep. not, not you know, maybe a little, if it's a slightly smaller case, it's a bit squeezy. But um, like a Saab or a GMT. Yeah, I think you're a full bracelet fit. guy. I think yeah, you're full, a full, yeah, full bracelet. Yeah, full bracelet. Yeah. Which, and I assume mm. that the Explorer is fitted on a full bracelet. So I need to buy an extra link or would I... That's this is I don't I, I don't know I guess you would have to ask them to yeah supply some extra links, which is interesting because I mean, you know I'm sure there's a spreadsheet of like the optimal bracelet length to case size and what they standardly include based on mm. wearer experience. Maybe they'll start shipping them with a few more once people start getting used to smaller sizes. Because I mean my my wrist is large, but it's not. I mean, you still wear out of yeah, the normal the is, like this. I'm not a you know. There's no rock. reason you wouldn't want to own a 36 mil yeah. Explorer. So, I mean, I think the, the, you'd have to order one in and it'd be a case of whether they charge you for it. Maybe They, they probably would. It's Rolex. Uh, the Explorer 2, that was uh, that was also there in, in both dial variations. Oh, fit the, me beautifully. Uh, that one, that was, uh, yeah. uh, That's that looks great on me, at that, which I find, you know, I've got mixed feelings about that because I think it's slightly too large, but it does look great. Mm, yeah, I, I think it's still too large, unfortunately. But yeah. it is uh, it's a good looking watch. What else? The um, some of the other date justs. Oh well, well, I just want to go straight to the date. Yeah, settle. Let... Some of the other date justs were there. Sort of the um, that new motif dial that they did with the palm, and then the other sort of the flute, one. The flute, the fluted one, is I believe it's called. It's that was fluted, really yeah. beautiful. I really yeah, liked it. Nice. I was looking at some photos uh, just yesterday, actually, and thinking that they will. I think they'll be exceptionally popular when they hit the market. Yeah. Because they look great. And then they're pretty subtle if you hit it in the right light. Yep. And I mean, as you said, the Daytonas, this is probably what I've been messaged about the most. I think they, they might have been the standout from from Rolex. Uh, first sort of question I get a lot is the Meteorite and what I thought of the Meteorite dials. I can't remember if we saw all of them. Uh, we definitely saw the yellow gold. I don't think, I think we, we got... 
Did we see the white gold on the Oyster Flex? I don't think they yes. had it. Uh, oh, no, we saw a, a different gold on different, Oyster Flex. Yeah, different. The Sun Dust. Yeah, uh, I don't think we saw the Ever Rose and the Yellow, but not the mm. white. Yeah, so interestingly, the Yellow Gold Meteorite, it felt a little bit washed out to me. And I think it's it's much better on the Ever Rose, which is a rose gold. Mm. Uh, the Respectfully disagree, I do. Do you? I don't, I don't mm. think washed out. I just think... I mean, it depends what you want. Like, I mean, you're always going to get more contrast, I think, with well, with that sort of dial and, and a, a darker metal. Mm, yeah, I don't, I don't think the contrast is important. Yeah, okay. Keep it out of this world. Uh, but yeah, as you said, the Sundust, which is a new dial sort of that they um, that they had for the, this year. So there was a Sundust on Oysterflex, and then there was Sundust sun with Baguettes. Baguettes were stunning. Yeah, was, but, I mean, was... both were. For for me though, the, the baguettes were really really beautiful. I was very very taken by those. Yeah, yeah, that was stunning. Uh, I think that's the highlights for the for the Rolex stuff. We, we didn't get to see some of the highly jeweled stuff. Obviously, that doesn't really make it out to the the prototype. Also, the Eisenkeisel. Yes, Eisenkeisel. Well, how, we're saying it wrong. However, we say it, we were Eisenkeisel. We were helpfully informed by uh, Rolex Australia on the correct pronunciation. They had mm. listened to us ha speculating. I can't remember what they said. So apologies. Eisenkeisel. Yeah, it was Eisenkeisel. Oh, that's right. Because we thought it was either one or the other. Turns mm. out it was both. Both. Uh, that was cool. Yeah, that was nice. Uh, quite subtle. I think. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the inclusion sort of get a bit lost uh, in the darker lighting, but that's okay. And then for the Tudors, I mean, that was 925. For me. 925, what a winner. 925. Yeah. 100% 925. Yep, I think that's all we need to talk about for Tudor. Uh, the oh, 18K bloody, was... No, nah, the, uh, don't forget about that that chronograph. That's a black bag chrono. That's a what? That's it's phenomenal watch. Yeah, it's interesting. I put it on and it kind of felt like uh, the Explorer 2 having them put them both on so close it's together. And that's what, I've been, that's what I've been telling people that it just sort of wears similar. I wouldn't say it's it's too big for me to wear, but it just it feels a bit too big still. And I guess, you know. It's a big chrono. Like, look, they're still using that that uh, collab movement that they've done with Breitling. Yeah, and the B01 um, thing. Whatever it is. And it's like, I, I think there's probably a couple of years left in that before it's fully amortized and they put their own in-house movement in and then when you do that you're, you're going to reduce the thickness and the size down by way of you know in-house and i mean it's it's rolex slash tudor i can't see them using a, a shared chronograph for for no. forever and well no nah, come on they're not gonna they'll, they'll go in-house like the um like the black no, Bay. I, I, I don't think they can justify the price of developing their own in-house chrono and keep it like at what's What's they the steel already Rolex have worth? one. That's the uh, interesting thing, isn't it? Well, unless they, but they they keep their tech separate. Mm. Like, I mean, pretty much. Yeah. Well, like, what's a Daytona worth, Andy? Eighteen five. What's a Tudor Black Bay Chrono worth? Eight. Brand names are, are, are a chunk of that. Big chunk. Steel and some other, you know, some other nice polishing bits, but it's the move. The movement's got to be. Uh, yeah, but they can do it in volume on this these Tudors. They don't do it on volume on the Daytonas, right? I mean, they uh, to an extent they do, but they can well, churn. Yeah, I mean, they can churn these out. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I think I think the B zero one with the uh, Tudor escapement has got to be around for a while. Like it's 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 a very modern chronograph. Like the B zero one, I think, is newer than the Rolex. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's probably movement. three years old now. Four years old as a as movement. I, I'm, I'm oh saying... no. So, so I mean, the, the like Breitling's B zero one has probably yep. been around since like 2010, 20... Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's Look, still got a lot of life left in it, I reckon. I reckon they'll give it another three. Well, three, and then they'll do their own thing. Let's not get stuck in the weeds on the uh, in-house <laughs> movement of Tudor's bloody... It's a lovely watch. I think the mm. aside from the movement and the, the dimensions that that sort of necessitates, I think... The, it's good. Yeah, it feels better than previous generations. It looks the bund strap is cool as well. You can kind of go from bund to strap, like leather strap to yeah, back to bund. Yeah, you take that little back bit off, can't you, pretty quickly. Yeah, just like, just kind of gets just threaded through. Off. Yeah, that was cool. Uh, and then what else? What else? What else? The 18K was just um, <sighs> I was a bit underwhelmed by that in real life. It looks a bit bronzy in person. It doesn't have the warmth of, you know, the gold that we're used to seeing from a brand I like Rolex. I think it was the, uh, I'm, I'm sort of scrolling through my phone. Um, 
I think it was the combo of the green and the gold that was hit slightly an off note for me. Mm. Like it just looked a bit too. I don't know. Just not James th- Stacey said he wished it was sort of like a navy blue, and I agree that would have been great. For for me, the coming after the nine two five, the nine two five was I think the most uh, elevated black bay I've seen in a long long time. The color was that taupe. Uh, is beautiful like it's in reality it's sort of more like a a ghost bezel color almost like that sort of slightly faded black gray look um the the metal and the sharpness and the precision of everything about it was really really beautiful and like that is what an upmarket shooter is the gold maybe it's because it's it's gold it just i don't know it looked a bit too uh blingy I, I guess is the, the word, and and the, and the blingy was the green, not the gold. I uh, I think well, it's a novelty. Remember, I think that the the, the bronze, the, the gold that they used, sorry, looked a little used bit to harsh. It had a brush finishing to it. You don't see mm. brushed precious metals from Rolex really. Uh, you see like slight grains on something like a a white gold Submariner or GMT Master, but they still retain s- sort of like a polish. Whereas this had more of a a uh, finishing that you would st- would see on steel, mm. which to me uh, was contradicted what it was actually made from, and it was a very and it's clear they've kind of they're putting a line between sort of what you would think of gold and what what this was. Like it wasn't uh, the, just the same gold that a Rolex is made from. It didn't feel like that, and I guess mm. maybe that's what I was expecting it to be was to kind of be like, oh, they've just like cased it in the same sort of you know glowing, lovely. Uh, yellow gold, gold or yep. you know ever rose that they that they have for a, for a Rolex. Um, I didn't I didn't hate the green. I just it's it's just novelty ish, you know. Yeah, I, I think compared I guess compared to the silver, it didn't wow me. God, mm. I'm sounding like a judge on a reality show. It just lacks the wow Simon factor. Cow. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're not even. It's not even watches that you should really compare to each other, other than you know. What? The silver and the gold version of exactly the same watch. Well, not really, because it's of the price point. I mean, the the remarkable thing about the silver is that it's that not price. much more than a stainless steel. So, I mean, silver's not that exy. It's a lot more expensive than stainless steel, though. No, yeah, that's interesting. Anything else from Tudor that we need to cover off? Oh, the silver, the silver dialed uh, black regular, bay. the black bays without the diving bezel. They were quite nice. Yeah, they were very industrial, weren't they? It's just a nice watch, Andy. If you want just one good watch with a silver dial, can't go wrong. Yeah, I'd wear one. Yeah. All right, time for a quick break. We'll be back to talk to Mr. Rolex. Today's episode of OT the Podcast is brought to you by Watchbox. Watchbox is the world's leading platform for the buying, selling, and trading of pre-owned luxury watches. Fueled by technology, innovation, and unmatched global experience in the high-end watch market. Hey, Felix, did you know that Watchbox own every watch that they sell? Nice. Yeah, it means they're not really a marketplace per se, and it means that they can implement universal standards across their global presence. They're also one of the largest buyers of pre-owned watches worldwide, meaning the selection on offer is amazing and ever-changing. Head over to their online store, thewatchbox.com, to discover the many hundreds. In fact, I just checked and there's thousands listed for sale with so many more in inventory. Watchbox have all the hot stock with brands like Rolex, AP, Patek Philippe, but that's not it. There's also a killer mix of truly special independent brands. You, know, you don't see them everywhere. Think FP Jean, Langer, Grubel Forse, even Richard Mill. They really have it all. There's also a lot of fun in the 100K you know, plus category. But regardless, there's always something new to discover. Anything catch your eye, Andy? Well, now that you mention it, there is an Everose Rolex GMT Master 2, Saru. That is really speaking to me. I'll drop a link in the show notes in case anyone's feeling generous. Look, uh, please do. Don't bother putting in the show notes. I'll just buy it for you. Don't buy it all at once. (laughs) For our international listeners who want that in-store experience, Watchbox have a handful of salons in the USA, UAE, Singapore, Hong Kong, and naturally Switzerland. To check out their unmatched global inventory, head to thewatchbox.com. You'll literally be blown away. And when shopping at thewatchbox.com, you can enjoy guaranteed authenticity, two years warranty, and free express global shipping. And while you're at it, why not join the Watchbox community? On top of being one of the world's largest dedicated luxury marketplaces for watches, they are also very serious when it comes to content. 
community is front of what they do. Felix and I can personally speak to the fun of Tim Mosso's Facebook group, for example, or subscribing to Watchbox Studios on YouTube, which has some ridiculously good content. From Tim Mosso to Mike Manjo's, Watchbox has enthusiasts at the core of their business. They've written some fantastic content on the website, things like historical pieces, really handy buying guides, and of course, industry news. So whether you're in the market for a new watch, looking to sell or even trade, hit up Watchbox today at thewatchbox.com. Buy world-class timepieces with confidence and convenience. Now let's get back to the show. Alrighty, Felix, we're back and we need to dial James Dowling, find him somewhere in the United Kingdom. Uh, well worth noting, we did speak to him a little while ago, probably before Watches and Wonders. So Definitely before Watches and Wonders. Definitely before Watches and Wonders. So views and opinions might have changed, but uh, this is the second time we've had the lovely James Dowling on the show. So it's going to be good to talk to him again. Andy, I'm very excited today. We have back okay. one of our alum, James Dowling. James Dowling, author, dealer, collector, and connoisseur. He's considered by many to be one of the world's leading authorities on Geneva's Green Giant. They, they don't call him Mr. Rolex for nothing. He was one of our first guests last year and people couldn't get enough of what he had to say. So we did what we had to do and asked him back for round two. Welcome back to OT the podcast, James Dowling. Welcome. It's good to be back. (laughs) Good to have you back. Good, let's just keep congratulating each other for for an hour or so and then we can go off somewhere and do some real work. Nice. Now, two questions, James, before we get... uh, I think Andy's got some burning questions about your collecting habits. First question, what has been your Watch World highlight since last time we spoke? My continued ability to wake up every morning free of COVID. Okay, that's that's pretty good, especially... Where you guys are in the, uh, you know, in, in the thick of it over there. Shit, shit is the word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't laugh, but um, perhaps my next question might be related to my previous. What are you looking forward to this year, in watches or in life? I'm looking forward to getting out. It, it, these are strange times. I, I have this feeling that I have a background as an archaeologist, and one of the things that when you're dealing with historians is that historians will deal with the Persian Empire or the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. And then as, as time moves forward, you get people who deal with the Dark Ages, the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries. Then you deal with people who deal with the 11th century, the Norman invasion and things of that nature. People, and people deal with shorter and shorter periods. And I've got this feeling that in the future, in maybe 50 years from now, at a historian's conference, people will be saying, what's your area of study? And they'll say, oh, I'm 2020. And somebody else will say, yeah, oh, me too. What particular period? And they'll say, uh, February 1st to the 3rd. Yep. Because there's so much shit going on that it, it, it becomes almost impossible. You know, they say that either Michelangelo or Isaac Newton was the last person in the world to know everything. Now, obviously, nobody can know everything. But now... To be an expert, you have to focus on such a tiny area because there's just so much bloody information out there. And in the last year, so much has happened. Hmm. And I'm not just talking about watches. Uh, I'm talking about yeah, really? uh, yeah, the things that the things that I would usually say the things that surround us. But for most of us, what's surrounded us has been our own homes. So these have been weird times, and they've been weird times in watches too. Because I, I think that what's happened in the world has tended to concentrate the minds of people in the last year or so. People have had a lot more time to sit around and browse the internet, and so we now have. Uh, about 250% more experts than we had at the beginning of 2020. And for a lot of countries, a lot of people have been furloughed, which meant they've been sat at home behind their laptops, Mm. but they're still being paid. Uh, But they're not spending money on going on holiday, going to restaurants, buying a new car, or what else. So people have had money, and people people have actually been buying watches online more than they were previously. And this has had the weird effect of making watch prices rise even faster than they 
stupidly were even before this. So Very it, interesting it's, point. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but I love making this shit up just so it makes me sound like I know what I'm talking about. No, I agree. Um, it's really, It's been really interesting. I mean, you kind of look at the, the prices of those pieces that everyone kind of 16, 18 months ago was saying, this is peaked, this is peaked. Surely you, this can't go any higher. Um, and they have gone higher. And then you go to, you know, brands and, you know, brands beyond Rolex that, you know, are selling out their stock. And my gut tells me that part of it is there's, you know, production and supply issues that have sort of been festering away for, you know, six, seven, eight months. Obviously these, you know, these brands can only have a certain amount of people in their factories, access to parts, raw materials, all that sort of thing is, is a lot harder. But also as you're right, like people are sitting at home with nothing else to do. They're not spending their money on, you know, a big holiday or a couple of big holidays. Maybe they've put off, you know, uh, uh, buying a new car or upgrading a car and they're really like leaning into their hobbies. Do you, do you think that this trend will continue with sort of uh, the greater, I guess, wider pandemic? One of the things I've learned through being really old and so having lived through lots of crap is that never, ever, ever guess what's going to happen in the future because... Mm you've got a 50% chance of being wrong. Um, like you, I thought lots of stuff had peaked. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I was wrong, and so on and so on and so forth. I, I, I just don't know. You know. The definition of a bubble is that at some point it bursts, and I've been buying and selling and collecting watches for long enough to have seen several bubbles mm. happen. And... What's going on right now strikes me as a classic example of a bubble, but every other bubble that has burst has done so under quantifiable conditions. We're not under quantifiable conditions, so I don't know. Um, I have no. no idea. I mean, and that's the thing, right? Like, exactly as you say, we, we were quick to call things bubbles, uh, you know, end of 2019, early 2020, if I think about the 5711. And Again, what's really interesting is like, you, this can't go any higher. And then what happens, Patek discontinued that specific reference and it keeps going higher. Um, so it's, it's, it's really fascinating to watch. Has anything emerged sort of through this period uh, and really kind of picked up a lot of heat that you've noticed that you weren't expecting? Uh, what I have noticed is that uh, watches which I consider to be fringe players mm -hmm. have become in the market. I'm not sure about... See, could I ramble on for five minutes? Go for it. All right. Okay, there's an, an old story about... Um, I don't know if you know about Portuguese sardines. <laughs> Do not. There are regular sardines, but in Portugal, there's a history of catching them and canning them and keep uh, uh, and, 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 and labeling them with a vintage. And over the years, people have begun to collect these, and they have they're not as valuable as port or really fine wines, but th th there is some investment value in them. And one day, a guy who was very wealthy was talking to another one of his very wealthy friends and his his friend said oh yeah yeah well you know i i bought a i bought a couple of cases of the uh 1994 portuguese sardines i mean they're they proved to be a very good investment for other friends of mine and uh you know so i'm laying them down i'm putting them in my cellar next to my uh chateau de pap and we'll uh, see how we do with that so the guy thinks hmm and in a weird moment when he had nothing else to do and was trapped in his house he ordered a few cases of portuguese sardines from different vintages laid them down in his cellar for, mm -hmm. forgot all about it really then a couple of years later his wife goes off on holiday with some of her girlfriends and one evening as he's watching television he realizes that he's forgotten to order any food and so there's nothing in the house to eat so he thinks ah got the sardines so he gets himself a slice of bread toasts the bread goes out the cellar opens up the box takes up a can opens the can spreads the sardines on the thing has a bite spits it out tastes like shit <laughs> so he calls his friend up and said, these fucking sardines you told me about. I, I bought like 10 cases of them. I, I, I just opened one and, and ate it. It's fucking awful. And his friend said, you idiot. Those aren't for eating. Those are for investing. 
and, and that's that's something that I wonder right now about some of the brands that I see the markets exploding, like Richard Mille and Francois Paul Jeune. Uh, is is the the sudden rise in the value of these watches a result of people realizing that there needs to be something other than Royal Oaks and Nautiluses and Patek Perpetuals to invest in? And so are these watches being bought by end users or are they being bought by uh, dealer speculator investors? Well, I mean, one follows the other. And I think there's a bit of uh, emperor's new clothes syndrome when you look at your, your early, you know, when everyone's telling you your early Roger de Bruyne's the best thing since, you know, sardines on toast, um, then it becomes that. Does it make a difference in the end or...? Is there an objective quality to these things or is it all just uh, hype and speculation and, you know, arbitrage? Yeah, I keep thinking about Elon Musk and Bitcoins. Um, Go on. Well, you know what happened in the last few days. Yeah. With, yeah. So I, I'm just wondering if that is, is a good analogy. I posted um, a picture of a 50 Cent 11 this morning to Instagram and I actually did the caption waiting for Elon Musk just to tweet. Five seven one one to see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> you imagine? Yes, nobody's actually. Does anybody know what watch he wears? Uh, I think I've read about it somewhere. He's got a, no. He's got a um. He's got a tag. Hoyer did a SpaceX limited edition. They did. Yes. I don't know if he wears one, but they did a really really early one, like you know, ten years ago or something. So maybe he wears one of them. I must have missed it because they do one every 48 hours. So, um, <laughs> a SpaceX launch or a Tag Heuer limited edition? Uh, I'll let you make up your own mind. Mm, mm, true. Now, we've sort of been talking about uh, some of the fringe watches, and I think you've sort of you've called out uh, Rich and Mill for uh, FP Jean. Are there any other sort of fringe players at the moment, to your mind? Uh, well, I mean, I, I was just talking about how things are happening in the market. And I see them uh, as comparatively new entrants into what is now the first division of watchmaking. Certainly in the, in the way the market sees them. I'm not talking about horological quality because that's A, indefinable and B, a very personal choice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that those two brands are the only two brands I know of that in, in the last year have really arrived because not only are they um, brands which are owned by their eponymous maker, mm. but they're also, they also are, they produce enough to be significant players and for there to be an active market in the final product mm -hmm. um, you know there's lots of people making 10 15 20 watches a year mm. who a bunch of people love and so, but there will never be an active market in them because there's never enough of them being sold so they'll uh, other than um mr dufour i don't think any of them really oh just a minute the my watch of the year 2019, the uh, Prodsham, oh, yeah. which retails at about uh, 75 to 80,000 pounds, Philip just sold one on a private sale for double that. Huh. So I, I think, uh, yeah, a, a few of them are able to, to command, to, to, to obtain a position in the secondary market, but very few of them are because they're just, there isn't, there isn't enough knowledge about them and there isn't yeah. enough of people need to people need the reinforcement of seeing one sold for x amount before they'll spend x amount on it yeah that's very interesting and i mean that's and uh, you know certainly those guys have got you know 20 30 years of history behind them now and there's enough of a uh, a catalog raisonne to to justify yeah those those big prices and you're right i, I can't think of too many others except maybe you know sort of roger smith that so that's sort of super low volume and consistently high in price. But I'm, I'm interested in some less mainstream watches of yours, James. I want to know about your weird watches, because you have a few. Uh, it, to be honest, it, it's probably the focus of my collection. Oh, yeah. Is, um, is 
when I wrote my book, first book on Rolex, uh, one of the final chapters was about the weird stuff because that's what's always fascinated me. And I wanted to call it Weird Shit Happens. But my publishers, who were based in the middle of Amish country in Philad in uh, Pennsylvania in the US wouldn't allow us to uh, to use the word shit. So that chapter is actually just entitled WSH. Um, <clears throat> and it's always been my focus. It's always, I, I, it's, probably, it's probably the defining thing of my life is it, I love dead ends. I love dead ends in horology, in all sorts of things. I love the idea that the road less traveled which is why, you know, I, I collect the stuff like marine chronometers and deck watches and, of course, quartz, because quartz is, you know, if you're a, if you're a, a true watch lover, quartz is the, is the thing that you walk around holding a vampire's cross up to, <laughs> because, of course, quartz was the thing that killed all the artistry and craftsmanship in the Swiss watch industry that had existed for 2,000 years. And quartz is, is literally the timekeeper of the devil. So no, <laughs> no person with any, any claims to loving timekeeping could ever have any, anything other than evil thoughts about quartz. So of course I embrace it wholeheartedly. And, and probably a good third of my collection is quartz. Has that has has that always been the way? Have you always loved quartz, or have you, you know, with increasing maturity and sophistication, come to realise that the devil's oscillating weight is for you? I I, I hate ever to be considered any of those words that you used about me, but <laughs> nevertheless, um, I, I I've always I've always thought that it weird that the pursuit of horology for the six or seven hundred years that it's been around has been the pursuit of accuracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when something comes along which has sublime accuracy, the proponents, these sudden seekers after accuracy, suddenly disavow it, which strikes me as the word hypocrite comes to mind. Um, I have stated on several occasions and will continue to state that the invention of quartz timekeeping was the single biggest advancement in horology in the 20th century. I, I, I don't see how anybody could argue against that. The problem is that the Swiss watch industry have managed to create this bizarre myth that somehow or other these evil bastards from the Far East came along with their evil courts and somehow destroyed this ancient, wondrous centuries of craftsmanship that we call the Swiss watch industry. There is something that the Swiss have labeled the quartz crisis and that somehow or other, they were the poor victims of something that happened completely and beyond their control. Yeah. And it's a myth. It's, it's a self-serving myth which allows them to get away with the fact that they screwed it up and they screwed it up big time. Now, I, I want to ask you about two specific watches and it's, it works out quite Go. nicely because the they're, they're two odd ones that you have, they're both quartz. One's Japanese and one's Swiss. Uh, mm -hmm. The first one, you've got an, a manually wound quartz watch. Yes, sir. Tell us the about it. The caliber eight eight. Tango from Seiko. Uh, like I said, I love dead ends. In the mid 80s, long before Greta Thunberg was born, somebody at Seiko was actually thinking about the environment. Because I don't know if, you, if anybody remembers, but the early quartz watches, early electric watches, were all powered by batteries that used mercury. And the disposal of these mercury batteries was beginning to have very serious environmental side effects. Mm -hmm. And so somebody at Seiko came up with the idea of a batteryless quartz watch. And so what the watch has is a tiny generator and a equally tiny accumulator. 
and you wind the watch for three minutes and that gives you enough power to run the watch for about 48 hours. Um, each day you have to wind the watch for about two minutes to keep it running. And until you have wound a watch for two minutes, you have no idea how long 120 seconds can be. I mean, you know, the first time I had to wind this thing from scratch, it felt longer than my first marriage. Um, it, it, you know, it's it just an interminable, interminable length of time. It's a stunning looking little watch. Um, and uh, I think it's great. And it's right here on my desk right now. Um, it was a gift from my Japanese publisher. I'd, I'd seen pictures of it and I'd heard about it, but I'd never actually seen it. And when... Um, you're going to wind it for two minutes, are you? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm just. I'm sitting here looking at it with its. Uh, so what? Gray what strap. finally? What finally sort of um, uh, put the pin on it? Like, was it? Was it the fact that it, no, no one could wind a watch for two minutes, or did battery technology get better? What? What made it obsolete? What made it obsolete? Well, oh, well, very simple. Is that nobody bought the bloody <laughs> because essentially. It was the answer to a question that nobody was asking at that mm. time. But what was crucial about the watch was that the, the watch was then developed into what Seiko then labeled AGS, Automatic Generating System. They simply added a rotor to it rather than uh, hand winding. And that's the connection. Uh, well, no, first it was AGS, then yeah. they uh, then they developed it further and it became kinetic. And then really the final uh, stop on that road is spring drive. So although this watch in itself was a dead end, in fact, it was the first step on a different path that ended up with one of the most interesting, um, with what I would consider the only hybrid watch of the 20th century. Fascinating. Now, that's it for Japan for now. We're going to come back there. But I want to jet back to Switzerland on the Concorde um, and ask about another dead-end quartz watch. I understand you have a quartz perpetual calendar from Rolex that may or may not be a prototype. Tell us what that it's is and how did you find it? Um, it's a prototype. It was one of a series... In the late 80s, Rolex decided that the 5035-5055 series of oyster quartz movements were doing well enough that maybe they should progress this technology onwards. Mm -hmm. And they developed a movement which was completely unlike the, the 5035 series. It was developed completely from scratch and it was developed the one thing that they wanted to, the, the one thing that Wilsdorf had worked on all his life was that people didn't have to fart around with his watches. So the idea of the bubble back was that it was a watch. It had, if you look at early bubble backs, you'll see how tiny the winding crown is because his whole idea was that, you, that because this watch was A, a chronometer and B, automatic, and at that time didn't have a calendar, you never really needed to set it. Mm -hmm. You would wear it for a month or so and never have to touch it. And that was always his thing. That was why he went to um, having quick set and so on, so that you needed to fart around with your watch as little as possible. So the, the two things you needed to mess around with your watch with the oyster quartz, well, the only times you need to mess around were when you change the date at the end of the month with non-31 months and when you change the battery. So the target for this watch was that this was a watch where you, you didn't need to do either of those because the, the, the watch would know when the 30, when 31, 13, 28, 29, Day months were and the idea was to try and get a 10 to 15 year battery life so they they accomplished this these two separate tasks 
first one was obviously simply a, an integrated circuit that would be could be programmed. Yeah. The key thing they did with that though was that they followed the uh, they followed the path first trodden on by Kurt Klaus with IWC, which was to to develop a perpetual calendar where all the controls could be done through the crown. There were no push pieces. You used the th the three hands were the indicators that you used to for in, in setting. And the other thing that they did was that they designed the watch to be incredibly energy efficient. So we, we use, if you know the Beta 21 quartz watches, you'll know that they don't, that the second hand continuously sweeps like a mechanical watch. It doesn't stop every second. The introduction of stepping motors for quartz watches was brought about because it increases the efficiency of battery, which means that the the motor that drives the timekeeping is only powered once every second. It's switched on and off. And by turning it off for most of the time, it saves energy. What Rolex did with this was that they used another step of motor for the minute hand. And the minute hand was only powered once every 30 seconds. So you saw discrete half minute jumps on the minute hand when the second hand hit the 30 or the 60. They also used the biggest battery possible. The battery fitted the, the battery didn't fit into the movement like most watches do. The battery filled the entire case back huh. of the watch. And so whether that, I think, I think the, the, they managed to get something like seven or eight years out of a battery. They produced a bunch of prototypes. The, I've heard rumours that there were 20 or 21 of them. I'm not sure. Nobody knows and nobody will ever know. Um, these watches, they are out there. Two of them have come up for sale, both at Antiquorum, over a period of about mm -hmm. 15 years. Mm -hmm. The first one came up for sale about 12 or 15 years ago. And the day before the sale, Rolex got a, an injunction from a judge in Geneva say, halting the sale, saying the watch had been stolen. Amazing. Um, when it went to trial, the judge asked Rolex, where's your police report? And Rolex had to say, well, we never filed a police report, sorry. We didn't know it had been stolen. Um, and then people who had worked in the R&D department came forward to say that it was commonplace for people in the R&D department to keep prototype watches because if they never went into production, nobody really gave a shit about them. Mm. So Until now on that, go ahead. really, really yep. quickly. So, you know, we're talking about a quartz perpetual calendar here by Rolex. Yeah. Peak of their technology. How did Rolex go from a brand, you know, making quartz perpetual calendars to a brand that basically has no complications, you know, beyond an annual calendar? And it's been that way for decades. Why don't they make complicated watches anymore? They never did make complicated watches. They never have. Um, essentially, you're asking, why don't, why don't Ferrari make a tractor? Porsche do. <laughs> Porsche did. <laughs> they don't anymore. They did. And... and and, and when Porsche made a tractor, they did it out of desperation because nobody was buying their bloody cars. Um, the simple truth is do what you're good at and stick mm -hmm. to it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, then it, I have a another weird watch in your collection. It's going to potentially is going to challenge that, but you're one of a very, yeah. very select group of people that actually own this watch and can attest to whether or not it's good. You have a Seiko Spacewalk, which is a watch Felix is absolutely obsessed with. He often tells me it's the coolest watch he's, you know, he thinks that they've ever made. I believe it was in one of our, we talked about it in one of our very, very early um, episodes of OT the podcast. I didn't even know it existed because it was that rare and probably released when I was 12. What's the deal there with that piece? Um, it, 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 it is a Seiko spring drive chronograph cased in a bullhead configuration rather than the conventional configuration. That's really all there is to it. It's a titanium case. Uh, there's nothing spectacular about it other than the uh, high visibility styling, which is the thing that attracted me to it. Um, but I no longer own it. Um, what? I, 
You said you were going to give it to me. Yeah, boy, you weren't even born when I got yeah. on that watch. So, <laughs> um, in all honesty, it, it it struck me as um, I, I love the look of it. I like the twenty four hour thing on it. But in all honesty, I was offered a very good deal on moving it on, and it it was it was a nice watch, but it it never struck me as being worth the money that I had invested in it and mm. that. I could get for it. Sure. That's fair. That's entirely fair. There's another thing I like. But I, about. I already owned. I already owned one of the very first model spring drives that I got from Mister Hattori, and it, the only thing that it had was the 24-hour hand and the chronograph. And I don't use chronographs that much. I'm not. I'm not honestly a big chronograph fan. But the thing about chronographs is that they they've always been sold on this sort of sporty, athletic, motor racing sort of appeal. And I want to watch the times. How long? It, how long I've had my feet up on the settee? How long I've been reading this book? Uh -huh. uh, I, I, I'm not a sporty, athletic guy. Sure. So. I, I don't want to watch that keeps reminding me how unsporting and unathletic I am. I have a wife for that. There's there's another thing that that's funny that you should mention the the sporty and unathletic part of it. The other side of the spacewalk story I like is how it was made. So it was a, a I think essentially a private commission for a guy named Richard Garriott, who was one of the yeah, first. Well, yeah. There you go. This reminds me of the great George Bernard Shaw quote about when William Randolph Hearst invited him up to San Simeon for the weekend. And at the end of the weekend, Hearst drives him down to this private railway station so that uh, Shaw can go back to San Francisco. And Shaw is just, there's been sort of non-committal the whole weekend. So finally, Hearst turns to him and says, so, so what do you think of my weekend cottage, Mr. Shaw? And Shaw said, well, it's kind of like what God would have done if he'd had the money. And, you know, like, <laughs> so, you know, the, the modern equivalent of William Randolph Hearst is somebody who invents video games. Yeah. You, you just have so much money, you you go into space. You just find new things to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, to me, it, it, it's not just conspicuous consumption. It, it, it's it's profligate consumption. Mm. So that's there's some there's some of sort of our high, I guess highlights from your your collection yeah. that are that are odd, unusual, uncommon, or sort of you know stupidly rare. What do you think is the most out there watch that you you know have owned or have owned? Somebody go through. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's, I, I'm I'm riffling through my mental filing cabinet. The dead end watch. The, uh, one of the watches that I've owned the longest and uh, would find it difficult to part with is one of the very first automatics, the Harwood. Mm. And Harwood was pre-Rolex automatic. And the company really went bust in the 19... late 20s, early 30s. And in the way that in the late 70s, 80s, people bought what I call ghost brands, companies that had a history but had ceased to exist. Mm. People like Breitling and things of that nature. People bought them and re resurrected them. Well, what isn't well known is that somebody tried to resurrect Harwood in the 40s, which is, you know, which strikes me as about the dumbest thing I've heard in, in all of horological history. Um, Harwood was, it, 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 I don't know if you, you understand how they, how they were structured. The, they had, Harwood wanted to get away from uh, having a crown on a watch because that's where all the dirt came in. Harwood yeah. himself was a watchmaker. So the watch was unable to be hand wound, so you had to shake the damn thing to get it going. But you set the hands by rotating a milled bezel and then putting it back into a set position. That obviously wasn't going to work any longer. So what they did, and also the little round watches, they wanted to do something different. So they made a square watch and you set the time on it by rotating the case back. It, it just... It is literally the answer to the question that nobody ever asked. It, it just, 
utterly pointless. Um, and so, wonderful. Wow, um, yeah, amazing. You know, a watch nobody's ever heard of, a watch nobody cares about, a watch that never, probably never went to market, and it's one of my favourite little watches. <laughs> yeah, very cool. We've talked a bit about vintage watches. What what we're curious yeah. to know is, you know, the current lineup from a guy who's big on collecting weird weird stuff. You know, what are the weirdest watches or most interesting watches or maybe watch brand out there at the moment that you find appealing? Or unappealing. And therefore appealing. <laughs> you two really have to take your show on the road somewhere. Um, when, when they let us, we'll be there. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> yeah. The awful truth is that when you get to to my age, you get as curmudgeonly as I am. You tend to look backwards rather than forwards. And there isn't really anything, there isn't anything out there right now that I would buy. Interesting. Um, the most recent watch I bought is, uh, is now more than a year ago. We're talking about new, new watches. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's a... Uh, a tourbillon from a guy called uh, Karsten Freshdorf, um, mm. who whose work I followed for probably fifteen years. He 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 worked with a number of brands, and none of which have managed to get off the ground. Uh, he only really managed to to, to be successful with ha having his watches reach the public when he did it himself. Um, there was always somebody in between him and getting the, the stuff to work. And I just, he, he's, he as a person is a really interesting character. He's intensely committed, intensely passionate, and thinks the Swiss watch industry is run by idiots. So, of course, I love him. Um, <laughs> and he, his watch is so in your face. Um, that I like it. it it's big. It, it's everything I don't like. And yet, put together, it works. So that's my most recent modern purchase. My most recent non-modern purchase is, is a Patek Philippe, um, but of course, a quartz one. Uh, a Patek Beta 21 uh, in white gold that's right here in front of me, looking beautiful. It looks like a half sucked chocolate. The, 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 so that's what they were going for. Yeah. <laughs> that, that 80s or 70s Patek design. Um, yeah. Now, I, I, I've got a question about, uh, I want to sort of start chatting about watch collecting in a second, but that question of, you know, the fact that you're, you've got this, this Patek Beta 21, do you yeah. think that we're at a point where we're going to see significant historic quartz watches like Oyster Quartz, like the early Swiss Quartz and, you know, maybe even the, the early Japanese stuff? Will that start getting a serious collector's market? Like, will we start seeing prices going, you know, sky high on that stuff? Or will it always well, be? Let, let me tell you, uh, let me give you some numbers. The first ever Swiss Quartz Sorry, the first ever Japanese quartz watch, the SQ35 Seiko. Current prices are in the forty to fifty thousand US dollars. Yep. The first Rolex quartz watch, the reference fifty one hundred, known as the Texan, came in came in two materials: yellow gold and white gold. It was uh, only the second watch that Rolex had ever made in a numbered limited edition. They made a thousand pieces. It's reckoned that about 20% were white gold, the balance were yellow gold. Yellow gold ones now are about 25 to 35,000 US. Mm -hmm. The white gold ones, I have seen them being, I've seen prices of a hundred thousand pounds as for the white gold one. Um, so you know, the, the, the question has already been answered. Oh, yeah. That's uh, that's done. I think we I think we we close that one and move on to the next one, which is watch collecting. You were mentioning just before how you know you're sort of you're not you know in, invested in new new watches and you're not really interested in what you know the the mainstream Swiss brands are sort of putting out to buy. 
I wonder what would you advise or, you know, someone's stuck next to you on a plane for a, for an eight hour flight and they've innocently mentioned that they want to start a watch collection and they're a, they're a young guy, they've got a bit of money. What would you say to them to do? I'd, I'd get up and go sit in the toilet for a time. <laughs> You can't. It's the new COVID regulations. You're not allowed to. <laughs> it, it's a personal thing. My aunt, if anybody asks me why I buy a watch, why I buy this one, not that one, it's very simple. It sings to me. It, 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 uh, I'm attracted to it. There's something about it. And if you put a gun to my head, I could probably tell you what it was that attracted me. But what, it, what makes it attractive to me won't necessarily make it attractive to you. I could suggest fields in which you might want to look at. But as for suggesting, I, I, certainly I would not suggest any area in which I think you would invest to make money because I have no idea where that's going and nobody does. And if anybody says they do, they're lying. Um, I, I think a, a worthwhile field of collecting right now is the Seiko chronographs made in the uh, 80s, the 7A2838-48 series of chronographs. They made some really interesting, they're, they're technically very interesting. They are the first analog quartz chronograph. Mm -hmm. They have uh, a tenth of a second timer, which is mesmerizing to watch go round. They have split second capability. They're, uh, I think they're 13 jewels, fully metal mechanical, move, uh, fully mechanical movement that's capable of having components taken out and replaced. So it's fully serviceable. Uh, so it's a watch for the future. And they employed uh, Giorgetto Giugiaro to design some of the watches for them. Some of those watches were featured in the movie Alien. It, it, it's got a lot of history going for it and they made them for about 10 years. So, and there's a wide variety of watches in that range and you can buy them for $250 US, mm -hmm. some of them, and some of them for $4,000 US. So there's a whole uh, plethora of watches in there to, to look at. Um, I'd look at uh, watches that were used for navigation, not just the Lindbergh, but any, any of the early German aviator style watches, things of that nature. Just buy what makes you happy, buy and, and what you can afford. I'm really lucky. I got into buying watches when literally I could do it with the money in my pocket. Now, now the sweet spot for watches is will my credit card company reject it or not? Entry-level watches are, are now almost four-figure watches. And, you know, that's, that's the effective barrier. The other, the one area I would advise everybody to collect, 70s weird watches. There was so much stuff. It was the practically the death throes of the Swiss watch industry, of the small manufacturers. They were putting out jazzy-looking watches with checkerboard dials and uh, it was as if the Swiss watch industry discovered the color orange. The number of watches with orange on them at that period is amazing. You can still find stuff for under $500 if you look around. What, what worries me now is that the internet has made things so easy. You can find anything anywhere. What people will never experience, and now I'm really sounding like an old fart, is they'll never have the joy of the hunt that I had when I started collecting watches, going around flea markets, being there at six o'clock when things opened. So you can go through tins of old watches and pull out two out of the 50 that were in this old can. Now everything's on the internet. Now everything has three paragraphs of description. So you're not discovering anything. You're just Googling it. And that's that sense of discovery, that sense of almost buried treasure is something I don't think that it's something I, I would miss if I was looking, if knowing what it what I had and what isn't there now. That's really good advice. Um, 
And I guess part of that is those experiences that come along with it. And if we, you know, I remember last time when you came on, you talked about, you know, the, all those Rolex bubble backs you bought, you know, back in like the 1990s when they were the, the hottest thing ever. And obviously, you know, the market on those burst, they were a, a bubble of bubble backs, if we will. Do you regret those experiences or do you think that that's sort of part of the fun that you've had over those decades? I don't regret it in the slightest. I, I, I learned a tremendous amount from that. So people should encourage that, like sort of like the learning and kind of having fun with yeah. it? Yeah. One of the things about collecting anything, whether it's stamps, these swords, watches, whatever, is that if you do it with your own money, in essence, you are paying to learn and you learn those lessons much sooner when it's your own money than when it's somebody else's experience. So I learned to recognize fake dials or reprinted dials because I bought one or two. And then when I tried to part exchange them for something else, somebody who knew more than me said, no, I'm not going to buy that because look, look, look. That's how I learned. Looking at somebody just showing to me on a screen or in a book wouldn't have the same effect because I wasn't as invested as I was when I suddenly realized, oh shit, I screwed up. Interesting. So, and I mean, I guess this is the, this is the other part of it, right? Like say you're sitting next to someone on that flight and they say, oh, I want some advice and you agree to go along with it. And then the next thing they do is turn their phone over and it's a picture of, I don't know, a steel Rolex sports model. What do you, what do you say to, to that person? I mean, you know, a lot of people in it, uh, caught in the momentum and the, the 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 chasing the hot watches but what would you say to that person who's sort of not yet in in the world of watches and they kind of pull that out how, how what's the sell how are you going to convince them to to have fun with it and buy things that reflect their personality and what they actually like this happens to me a lot and people mm-hmm. say, you know, once they know that i'm into watches and, and i i ask a series of questions and the questions i ask are are you buying it for yourself or are you buying it for your peer group? Are you buying it for, uh, is accuracy important? Do you want to be able to wear it only on certain occasions or do you want to wear it all the time? Mm-hmm. Do you care what other people think when they see your watch? And here's the, here's the, the thing that I've discovered over the years. Nobody ever answers honestly. Interesting. Because everybody says, no, I don't care what people think. Uh, I'm buying it for myself. Yes, accuracy is really important. Um, yeah, I'd like to be able to wear it. So I tell everybody, okay, what you want to do is buy the Swatch model SW001, which is the black black case with a white dial. That does everything you want. Everything you just told me that you want from a watch. What do they say to that? Oh, yeah. really? No, oh, no. <laughs> nobody ever said no but i want to spend ten thousand pounds the awful truth is that most people don't know what they want in a watch mm-hmm. most people when they when they start to collect watches they do so because they either admire a person who wears that watch or they see the watch on somebody's wrist or in an advert and think i i I think I would like the lifestyle that implies. I don't think anybody decides to buy a watch from cold, their first major purchase by thinking, "Mm, yes, I want something that has the double lever escapement um, rather than the uh, classic Earnshaw escapement. You know, one of the biggest cons in the world is the Swiss have managed to convince everybody it's called the Swiss lever escapement. It wasn't. It was invented by (laughs) Earnshaw. Um, who was about as Swiss as Mickey Mouse. Um, Buying a watch is not a rational decision. No. Why people collect watches, why people, you know, most people don't collect watches. Here's the weird thing. You know, you and I live in this weird world where watches are an important part of our lives. And we hang around the Swiss watch industry where it's the main part of their lives. It's the, sure. almost the only part of their lives. But for 99.999997% of the world, they don't even think about watches. Um, we, are, we are stamp collectors. We are train number collectors. We are, we are one step away from sociopaths. We are, we're fringe members of a fringe society. 
And the greatest achievement of the Swiss watch industry has not just been to survive all that's mm -hmm. happened in the last hundred years, but to convince us that these are things that we should spend our hard-earned money on. Should we be collecting watches? If it floats your boat, go for it. I like it. I like it. Well, I mean, the other part of collecting is, you know, uh, selling and letting things go. And uh, as a guy who's been in this for a while, uh, you know, and, and following you for, for quite some time, you, you occasionally list pieces for sale. Um, you know, I know you're not so much in the dealing world anymore, but, you know, just pieces from your own collection pop up and, you know, we see you list something and it's always really interesting and it's full set and really, really nice. Um, how do you decide how to let things go? Usually because I found a better one. Okay. So you're constantly, you're still at that point in your sort of love for the hobby that you're kind of still adding things in, looking for better condition, yeah. looking for better variants Always. of what you already have. I, I'm like a shark. I have to keep moving forward. And, and what if it's something that you, that, you, that you love and is rare and, you know, you're sort of attached to and you still like as a watch? And someone offers you a what you would consider to be a stupid pile of money for it. Do you go with the money or with the object? <laughs> depends. I, I suppose the honest answer is it depends how stupid that stupid pile of money is. But sure. it, it, in, in all honesty, nobody has ever offered me money for a watch that is in my what I would describe as my core collection mm -hmm. that I would contemplate. In fact, I don't think anybody's ever offered me money for anything that's in my core collection. It's all too weird. Yeah, yeah, it is. What won't you sell? Uh, I don't know. I've never been. I've never been confronted with having to make that choice. All right. What's and your favourite until... piece? Your most special piece in that core collection? That Harwood. Hmm. My probably my uh, white gold Beta Twenty One Rolex. And no amount of money could buy it off you. One day I will sell it because one day I will sell all my watches. And um, when I when I sell it, I will sell my entire Beta Twenty One collection, and I'll put the whole lot up for sale. I don't know if anybody has got as comprehensive a collection as I have. I mean, I've got you know some of the really weird ones like a Bulliver. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, at some point, at some point, everything will be sold um, because. You know, I'm not going to have a Viking burial where they're all <laughs> piled around me in the in a boat and set on fire and set out to sea. So what else is going to happen? I'd rather, I would, in all honesty, rather rather they were sold while I'm alive, mm -hmm. and I can then decide what's done with the funds that are raised from them, than uh, leave them for my wife to have to sell after I've moved on to the great watchmaker in the sky. Um, so yeah, you, when you get to my age, you have to think about being, you know, being dead. Um, <laughs> that's the reality of it, isn't it? That's, um, yeah. So it's an exit strategy in a sense, um, which is, which is quite interesting to think about. And I, I like how it adds some cohesion to what you've been doing, right? Like, as you kind of say, you're going to package up that beta 21 collection and it's going to be a whole thing. That's that's quite a, um, a quite an interesting approach. So, I want to ask you an even harder question than that. This is a, uh, it's, a it's a hypothetical. You have a time machine and you have five thousand pounds. What year are you going to, and what are you buying? Nineteen ninety five. Mm -hmm. Five thousand is not going to do it, mate. I'm sorry. Um, you can go to the um, the the Greyhounds first. You've got a form guide as well. <laughs> okay. Um, in in 1999, I was at a Sotheby's auction in New York City, uh -huh. and I talked about this on an Instagram post a while back. There were a page with five watches on it. There was a black dial. 6538, 6238, sorry, um, which was estimated at $3,000. It didn't sell. There were two non screw down Paul Newmans, one black, one white dial, uh -huh. and there were two screw down Daytonas, uh, both white dials, one with uh, one, one of three, uh, one with the metal vessel, one with the uh, plastic vessel. The 
Paul Newman sold for $8,750 each, and the uh, non-Paul Newman sold for about half that, just over $4,000 a piece. That entire page was $20,000. Okay. That page is somewhere in the region of $600,000 now. A bad return. At that auction, I bought two bubble backs, two steel bu bubble backs, which I paid $12,000 for the two watches. If I had them now, I'd be lucky to get half that. Mm. At that same auction was a Louis Cotier Patek Philippe World Time with a Cloisonne World Map in the middle. It hammered for $225,000. I think at the moment that's probably a three to $5 million watch, maybe more. Wow. So, you know, if you'd had a chunk of money at that time, it would have been possible to buy stuff. Even, in, even as late as, uh, as recent as 15 years ago, there was a Cartier sale at Antiquorum um, where some phenomenal pieces came up and sold for uh, sort of 10, 15,000 US that are now worth 100,000. Um, a lot of people don't realize just how recent this explosion in the value of the high-end pieces has been. Um, it hasn't been gradual. It has been very recent. And it has been, a, a lot of it has happened since the 2008 crash when essentially government started issuing free money. You could borrow money at, you know, 1%. Um, so people stopped putting their money in banks and people start putting their money in stuff. That's a that's a very good perspective, and I think that's possibly the best. Um, well, it's a good answer to the sort of the time machine question, but it is one that sort of focuses on the um, the money side of it, which which is interesting, and I think it makes sense. Like if you can turn whatever that that page worth of Rolexes is into a you know a couple of houses, um, I think that's a probably the smart thing to do. Um, I've just sent you a, a, a picture, actually. Uh, on your Instagram, James. You have? Oh. Yeah, you don't check it All out. Right. Don't check it out. Check it later, because <laughs> in my hand, I'm holding, and I think it's, I think it's what you're referring to. Uh, important watches, wristwatches, and clocks. Sotheby's, New York, October 1999. Yeah, there you go. I, I randomly, it's one of the few catalogs I have, and I refer to it often. <laughs> Looking at the madness of pricing yeah, over the last twenty pitches. years, yeah. it's, and I've got I've got the price list of what they all hammered in for. It's it's a very depressing read. Um, yeah, but uh, it's it, it really encapsulates what makes this this uh, hobby obsession or pastime great. But I think we should probably wrap it up here, Andy. What do you think? I think so. James has been very generous with his time. I imagine it's about time for another cup of tea or coffee. I think it's time for something stronger on our end. Um, After this, I'm going to say gin. Um, well, your end as well. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, James. It's been a real treasure having you, and we'll have to have you on next year. That long? <laughs> well, you know, we don't want to... All um, right. We're out our Maybe we'll shows. get you back when Rolex released some new models for 2021. Oof. Don't hold your breath. Um, thank you very much, gentlemen. As always, it's been fun. I, I just wish that the thing that I miss more than anything is I don't miss Basel and SIHH for all the watches. I miss it for the social aspect. I miss mm -hmm. getting together with people who share the same passion and emotion and can take the piss out of the uh, people presenting to us um yeah that's what i miss and i would like i'd like to see that back please all right guys have fun stay well you too mate and there we go james dowling as always is a treat 
to have onto the podcast. He is a gentleman and a scholar and has a fascinating take on Watchers, Andy. Yeah. Yeah, he's always, he's always just a fun guy to talk to. And, you know, I miss seeing him. He's one of those guys that's always good to see IRL. He just, he just says what he thinks, uh, which is, and he's, it's, it's always refreshing and he's always entertaining to chat to. Um, so thank you, yeah. James. Thank you, James. And thank you, Watchbox, for sponsoring today's episode, thewatchbox.com. Check out their great stock. It's always, uh, it's always changing. Thank you to everyone who emails us, otthepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, thank you for everyone to everyone who's you know jumped on Instagram lately. Ot dot podcast. Yeah, and getting on my henchman watch. Quick, getting quick. We'll uh, we'll do an announcement post when it when it closes. But there's some great answers on there as always. Nice, Felix. Uh, and if you like Ot, do you know what you should do, Andy? You should review it. Review it. Five star review. Yeah, five stars. Uh, yeah, tell your friends. Share it. Post oh, it to Insta. Post it to your Facebook groups. Like know. and subscribe. Yeah, Facebook groups. Love that. Anyway, uh, see you next time. See you next week. Bye.